earlier, I pointed towards the Second World War as a reason for the popular and scientific reluctance to accept a minimal effect conclusion. A second reason was the arrival of television in the 1950s and 60s as a new medium with even more power of attraction than its predecessors. The effects of television were presumed huge, but not in the old magic bullet way, not so much direct, short term and uniform, but long term, with repeated exposure. One new theory called cultivation proposed that after repeated long term exposure, audiences tend to shift toward the dominant media viewpoints on matters. Indirect effects. Much more attention was given now to indirect effects like associated effects. For instance, when we see a commercial of a muscular man eating ice cream, we might not run into the shop to immediately buy an ice cream. But perhaps after several commercials like this, we will associate this particular brand with a healthy appearance, thereby increasing the likelihood that we'll prefer this brand. These types of effects are also typically longer lasting than the magic bullet and hypodermic needle effects. Personal effects. Now it was appreciated that one audience member is not the same as the other. Effects therefore are pluriform and have to be studied in context. A violent cartoon might have a completely different effect on a child that watches it alone than on a child that watches it with siblings or parents. Reinforcement rather than change. Studies increasingly indicate that reinforcement effects are quite strong. People remember and process content selectively based on their own knowledge and predispositions. Therefore, things that connect with their preferred reality will sooner be processed, a topic that we'll discuss more in length in the next week, by the way. Television was in many ways a new platform. It captivated its audience, created new worlds within a media reality. Television shows had a huge impact. Unlike the paper, people watch television together. So in many ways it was a social medium as well. And it was also a topic for discussion. You could quickly isolate yourself if you weren't aware of new programs and shows on television. Hypermediality, when people reference media content, became one way of opening yourself up or closing yourself off to a group. We can imagine the new coworker who is the only one who hasn't seen a new series on television. He'll probably feel as though he's less part of the group now. And you know, to some extent, this is true. Television became a preferred way to spend time, alone or together. Shows and series were a way to identify yourself, as an audience member or even a fan of that particular program. Social learning, when people learn skills or how to behave in situations in a social setting, proved to be quite effective through television. Even though I've never been in a fire, I have some idea of what to do and avoid because of many movies and series. If these ideas are correct, of course, remains to be seen. But I do have some inkling based on media exposure. Just like I think I know what to expect in a courtroom, a space shuttle or in a dinosaur attack. Not because of direct experience, but through mediated experience. Other scholars established socialization effects for television. Socialization is when we learn norms and values in an informal way. Just like we learn from our parents, family and friends, we learn from television as well. All of these effects were probably not unique for television compared to other media. But they were very apparent in television. So it was probably the rise of television more than anything that caused the final paradigm. A compromise between minimal and powerful effect. This is the dominant paradigm of today that have negotiated media effects. 